slides. Um, what I'd like to do today is talk very briefly about myself. I can actually talk for a long time about myself. And uh, one of the sort of formative experiences for me when I was in college was I wanted to be a writer. And so Edward Albee, the famous playwright, came to my school. And I hurried off to, to see him because I wanted to get a look at what an actual real writer was. And Edward Albee got up and gave a speech and then left. So, and it was like a professor's speech. You know, he was a pretend professor, except he wasn't very good. And, uh, and I was disappointed. I wanted to talk to him about what I wanted to talk about. So today, I'm going to talk about what you want to talk about. The, um, let me tell you a little bit. Uh, I grew up in a uh, suburb of New York City, a town called Roslyn. I went to high school there. And I was the first kid in my high school to go to Harvard. I was terrified. And uh, turned out OK. I was in the English department, but they didn't like the way I wrote. So I, and I had always been very interested in writing. I was one of those kids who, at a very young age, had a feeling about what I wanted to do. So in the third grade, I was writing. And when I was in high school, I wrote for the school paper and for the town paper covered local sports and stuff like that. So I was pretty proud of my writing. And since they didn't like it, I, I switched departments and studied anthropology. And from there, I went to medical school. And in the course of um, being a medical student, I had to um, pay some of my tuition. So I began to write books just because that was the only thing I knew how to do. You know, I thought, well, maybe, maybe I can earn some money by writing books. And at that time, um, the sort of James Bond books were very popular. This was the late 1960s. And uh, so I began to write sort of James Bond thrillers. And uh, they were original paperbacks, and I found I could eventually do them in about 10 days. So Christmas vacation would come, and I would write a book. And it was great, great training for a writer because the whole idea of it was that I should write something that was not original, that was not an expression of me, that was, it was in, I wrote it under a pseudonym, it had nothing to do with me personally. It was just intended to be a sort of thing that people would want to read and that the publishers would take it and print it and never send it back for me, to me for any changes because by then, Christmas vacation was over, and I was back in the hospital. I didn't have any time to change things. So it was, it was fabulous. I did six or seven of those books. And by the time I started to write under my own name, I had none of the anxieties that writers usually have, because I just, it was just another book. I retired from medicine. It's hard to, to describe now what that was like. That was a huge deal. It happened in 1969. Um, in, in the late 1960s, doctors were revered only slightly below Supreme Court justices. It's, not, it's gone now. That people don't feel that way about doctors. So for me to quit medicine and go to Hollywood was, it used to be like, you know, like quitting the Supreme Court to become a bail bondsman. You know, it was... It was an inconceivable transition, but it was what I wanted to do, so I did it. Um, why don't I stop there and let you guys ask me some questions? Hi, my, my name's Camille Rosses, and I'm a freshman here, and my question for you is, what motivated you to speak to the students here at Cleveland High School? I was asked to do it. <laughs> You know, it's a, it's a funny thing about writing. You don't get to, um, to see a, an audience ever. You know, sometimes I'll be on an airplane, somebody's reading my book, and I look at their face. They're smiling or they're frowning, but, I mean, uh, <laughs> or they slam it shut. But, uh, you know, uh, usually you don't get that chance. When I first started directing movies, it was amazing to sit in the audience and you think, wow, look at how all these people are reacting to what you've done. I'd never had that experience. So it's really helpful to me. It's also why I do book signs. I like to see 
what everybody's thinking about. This is for my benefit, in other words, not yours. Go ahead. Hi, I'm Alexandria Noble, and I'm also a freshman here. Um, many kids my age view college as extremely important. In fact, our student body president was accepted to Harvard, and we are all very, very proud of her. Um, how did your dreams and aspirations differ from when you entered Harvard until when you left? One of the things that I liked about Harvard, I didn't know it at the time, there were two things that were really great about Harvard for me. One was that they basically left you alone, and you could kind of do what you wanted. And the other thing was that there was a great um, variety of things going on. It was a true university, you know? So I, w I wanted to, uh, I'd always had an interest in astronomy. A friend of mine was studying astronomy. We went to the observatory one night, and saw how all that worked, and I decided I didn't want to stay up late at night freezing myself to death, so. Um, but that's great, you know. Uh, it's great to have the ability to explore these different alternatives, and in terms of what I did, if when I went into college at 17, if somebody had said, when you come out, you're actually going to go to medical school, I would have said, absolutely not. But slowly over that four-year period, I really changed my goals enormously. The idea about being left alone was um, also, in a sense, an accident. Harvard, at that time, had a tutorial system where one of your classes, as a junior or senior, was with a single teacher, and you would write papers. And I would meet with my, my teacher was a professor named William Howells, and uh, he was very interested in popular writing. He, he himself was a popular writer of anthropology books. And um, I would meet with him once a month, and he would say, what would you like to write a paper on? And I'd say, well, I'm interested in Neanderthals. And he'd say, okay, we'll start, here's some references, look here, look here, look here to begin, and I'll see you in a month. And my job over the next month was to do all this research, write a 25-page paper, turn it in, he'd read it. The next week we'd meet, he'd discuss my paper, mark it all up, tell me what was wrong and then say, what would you like to write about? And I say, well, I'm kind of interested in what happened to the Indians in the, in the southwest of the United States, and you know, why some of, these, some of these groups disappeared. OK, start with this reference, this reference, this reference. I'll see you in a month. And that was how I spent basically the last two years of college, and it's kind of how I spent the rest of my life. Um, I'm Daniela Benstock. I'm also a freshman here. You stated in your remarks to the Commonwealth Club in San Francisco that one of the most powerful religions in the Western world is environmentalism. Can you explain why you refer to environmentalism as a religion? Mm. Because I have trained in anthropology, uh, the idea that anthropologists have about what constitutes a religion or what functions a religion serves are a little bit different from how you think about it if you categorize religions as, you know, Christian, Muslim, Hindu, something like that. So from the standpoint of an anthropological view, a religion is a collective set of beliefs. Um, it ha there is a leader or leaders who promote the beliefs among the followers. Followers make some kind of contribution or um, uh, change in uh, their lifestyle based on the religious belief. Uh, the religious belief gives them a total view of the world in terms of what, how the world is structured, what's right, what's wrong, what's good action, what's bad action. That all fits perfectly onto environmentalism. The other thing that environmentalism does, which I said to this group, is that it rather precisely maps a lot of Judeo-Christian beliefs about the origin of the world and so on, so that in environmental thinking, there is a view that it, there used to be a sort of Eden, and then people came and ruined that, that Eden, um, and that we are therefore sort of original sinners because we're destroying this planet. And what we can do, however, is get salvation through sustainability. And if you're a good person, you will seek salvation, and if you're a bad person, you'll drive SUVs. Um, 
that is a kind of a religious belief. That was my argument. What brought you your greatest joy, the success of your books or the success of your directing, ER, the moving television? You know, it's really weird. I had a, um, I knew a guy who had been in, in the movie business for most of his life, and then he vanished for, for a long time, and he kind of came back. And he had been a Buddhist monk in Nepal. And he returned, he said, because his son was on drugs and he wanted to be there for his, to help raise his kid. And, I, and so he had this completely different perspective. And he said to me, he said, you know, show business doesn't make people happy. And it's a very strange thing. There's something about, uh, it's exciting. Uh, you're working with tremendously talented people. It's glamorous, you know, from the outside. Um, movie stars, you know, and red carpets and all this stuff. And uh, But there's something about this kind of collaborative work that drains a lot of the pleasure away. And I don't know why it happens. It, it, you know, we talk about it sometimes. So my answer to you is working on books is great. You know, you do the book, it's all your own effort. You know, what's good about it is yours, what's bad about it is yours. And when I'm done, I can hold a book in my hand and say, I did that. I can't say that about a movie or about ER. A lot of people did it. Hello, I'm Jasmine Zuniga, freshman here also. Um, my question is, um, would you ever consider going back to studying medicine as a full-time job? Would I consider going back? Um, I wouldn't, Jasmine. The, um, but I think it's, it's just, it's, um, I think it's my personality. You know, for, I don't know why. Somebody once described what I do as, as um, cud chewing behavior. You know, it's like a cow. My life is like a cow. Um, <laughs> you know, the cow sees one clump of grass, so they eat that clump. And then they see the next clump, so they eat that clump. And then they see the next clump. So the cow is just going from clump to clump. But after a while, you see the cow is going across the whole field. You know, but the cow doesn't have that kind of a goal. The cow just eats the next clump. Uh, for me to go back would be, well, first of all, I'd have to do all my training over again. Um, but also, I feel in a certain way, I never left it, you know? I mean, when, when we started ER, you know, we were in the hospital, this hospital sat all the time. I thought, you know, I've been trying my entire life to get out of the hospital, you know, and here, here I am again. <laughs> so it's, um, and I'm not a good doctor. I'm a terrible doctor. People would come to me and they'd say, <laughs> you know, doctor, I have these pains and they're worse after I eat and so on. And they obviously had an ulcer. And, I would think, I wonder what kind of um, disease I could dream up that would explain these symptoms. And, <laughs> and it took me a long time to realize that they weren't coming to me for an imaginary disease. You know, they're actually coming for help. And it was not my job to make up stories. <laughs> so it was, it was good that I got out. They'd also, you know, when I got calls in the middle of the night and they'd say, Jimmy is... You know, Jimmy has a fever. I thought, well, just give him a Tylenol, you know. <laughs> I was very unsympathetic. <laughs> Hello, I'm Samir Ball, and I'd like to ask about a common theme in your book being technology gone askew. Do you have, does this theme have any relation to how you feel about technology? Well, it does in the sense that... Um, I, th I feel we live in a society that um, where, where technology has just phenomenal boosterism from, you know, the corporations that are making the technology and, and the people who are buying it. I mean, there's a, with each new technology, there are these fantastic claims that are made and um, these fantastic hopes that people have for it, and it, it never really turns out, you know I mean? I'm old enough so that um, when I was not in my life, not that much younger than you, television was introduced. 
For the first 10 years of my life, there was no TV. So I remember a world without television. I remember what people said when television came in about how it was going to be this wonderful universal education and everyone was going to know all the plays of the Western world. And, you know, in reality, it turns out to be shows about people sticking their faces in, you know, plates full of bugs and eating them. And um, one of the early founders of television who worked all through the beginning said, you know, we thought we had these grapes hopes for this medium and we, what we've actually invented is the biggest waste of time in the history of mankind. And there's a way in which that all that's true. You know, the, the automobile offers universal freedom and uh, transportation for everybody, but we all sit in traffic jams, you know. And um, so there's this kind of, self, I don't mean to say it too strongly, self-defeating aspect of technology. So I'm, I always just look at the other side of things. Hello, my name is Jennifer Cavetto. I'm also Hi. a freshman. Um, while at Harvard Medical School, it is said that you nearly passed out many times at the sight of blood. What persuaded you into staying at the school year after year? It's true. It's true. I, I was so... I couldn't draw blood. I, I would just get dizzy. So... Um, my first uh, rotation in the hospital was in this, um, was in the Boston City Hospital, and the job of the medical student was to come in every morning before rounds and draw blood from 30 patients. And usually you just went boom, 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 boom. You know how fast you can draw blood. Well, it took me half an hour because I would start to draw the blood. I would feel sick. I'd run to the window. I'd stick my head out the window. It was January in Boston. It was cold, you know? <laughs> I'd settle down. I'd wipe the sweat off my face, and I'd go to the next patient. It was, it was just a sort of fortunate thing that some of the people on the ward were drug addicts. And, you know, they saw me coming. They go, no, no, you're not touching my veins. And they, I would give them the needle and the stuff, and they would draw the blood for me. You know, I, I could come back and collect it, but it still took me a long time. What's odd is that uh, by the time I got to the emergency room, I could do anything. Because um, there was no time for me to indulge this emotional reaction or whatever I was having. You know, everything was rushed. Uh, you, you were on the line. You had to sew people up. You had to, and it didn't matter. You know, it didn't matter if the person, the little baby was screaming, screaming and moving, and you had to somehow hold him down and get the cut sewn up. And so that was an interesting experience to realize that um, these terrible, terrible fears or emotional responses that I had actually could be, could be taken away quickly if it, something else was more important. Oh, uh, hello, my name is Scott, and uh, my question is, how often do you apply your anthropology knowledge to your books or your writings? A lot. Um, anthropology is a, uh, in my way of thinking, is a way of looking at the world. You know, it's a sort of, uh, I don't know if you know much about it, but it's a kind of a combination field of many different disciplines. It involves everything from psychology to uh, really, medicine. I studied physical anthropology, which is sort of CSI stuff. We were given, for example, um, one of the things we had to do is identify um, bone specimens. So we would have these quizzes where they'd hand around little bits of wrist bone, and you were supposed to say whether it was male or female, left or right, all that stuff. So we were trained to identify physical remains that you would find in an archaeological site. That's one part of anthropology. Another part of anthropology is you know, social behavior and how people interact in ways that they do. And um, it's not always widely shared knowledge. When I wrote, um, how many years ago? About 14 years ago, a book called Rising Sun that talked about the differences between Japanese and Japanese society in the United States, and it caused a lot of furor here because people claimed it was racist. But in fact, I was just doing what was anthropological thinking. You know, and um, if you go to Japan, my publisher, who has been, you know, my longest publisher, 35 years we've been together, taught me all these things about how to behave and how to have a meal in a Japanese way, you know. And you have to, for example, you have to pour um, sake for the other person. 
you can't pour, you can't pour it for yourself. You can't pour shoyu for yourself or another. And that means you have to be watching other people. And so sometimes you have this odd thing where somebody would hold out their their sake cup and say, "May I have some more?" And the and the cup is full. You know, and that means you're supposed to notice that. Um, well, your cup is full. They'll try and pour for you, is what I meant to say. And they'll say, can I give you some more? And your cup's full. Well, what you're supposed to do, actually, is drink a little bit, let them pour, and realize that they're pouring for you because you're so neglectful that their sake cup is empty and they need it refilled. I mean, it's really different from how we think about things, which is, hey, you want some food? Get it in the refrigerator. You know, it's very different. Hi, my name is Edwin Elias. I'm a junior here. And uh, my question is, you said that the greatest joy that you get is from writing and not necessarily from producing and everything. When you write a book and it gets um, made into a movie, such as like Jurassic Park, Lost World, The Rising Sun, um, are there? how do you feel like when somebody reads a book and they see the movie, they go, oh, they left this out, they left that out. How do you feel when they leave things out, like directors pick and choose? How does that make you feel? Or what are your thoughts on that? You know, I've, I've um, done it myself, and I've done, I actually did the first draft of Jurassic Park, and, and uh, I've done the screenplays of some of the other books I've worked on. So I really, what I know is the average book will be 400 pages. A screenplay is 120 pages, but it's in a particular format. Most of you have probably seen a screenplay. If you convert it to text, it'll be 40 pages. So... What that means is 90% of your book is gone. That's just how it is. And you may be able to try and make a reference to some idea if you can find a visual thing or, you know, stick something in at the end of a scene to try and beat the fact that 90% of your story is out. But in the end, that's how it works. So, um, you know, I I'm okay with that. And I actually feel fortunate. I th I'm, I'm happier with the books that have been made, uh, the movies that have been made for my books than most people are, a lot of people are. You know, I've, I think a couple of them turned out really well. So that's great. Hi, my name is Brian Lee. And my question is, how would you feel if technology was used more violently than like more of a helpful way? Well, here's the thing about technology, Brian. It's, it's, um, it is always, in a certain sense, neutral in terms of use. Almost anything, you know, I mean, you can die from an overdose of water. The, um, uh, every single thing that you might invent can be used positively or negatively or neutrally. And that's just how things are, you know? A car can... Um, a car can save you, or you, a car can kill you, or you can hit somebody with a car. And um, it's hard to think of any technology which is either totally good and can't have any negative aspect, or totally bad and can't have any positive aspect. You know, even the most toxic poisons from spiders now are sometimes uh, converted into drugs because they have anticoagulant effects or something like that. So it's just. How we use technology is the important question, whether we're able to decide how to use it well, not anything about what's inherently in the technology. It's neutral. Hi, my name is Han Wo Kim, and when you were in college, it is said you wrote thrillers under a different, different name. Why would you do that? I wrote really fast. Um, I can't do more than one thing at a, at a time. I'm, you know, there are people who can talk on the telephone and write things. And a, a friend of mine is a Buddhist philosopher named Ken Wilber, and he's running this whole new school and website, and he gets up at 2 o'clock in the morning and starts writing. I couldn't do that. Uh, I can only do one thing. So when I was writing, I would actually drop out of school, uh, but only for a short time. And in second year of medical school, they have these, you know, one-week instructional courses. So to this day, I know almost nothing about the kidney because that was a week that I, <laughs> I stopped and wrote a book. Hi, my name is 
Chairman Roth, and you stated that there was nothing wrong with DDT and it shouldn't have been taken off the market. What is your reasoning for that? I don't know if I stated there was nothing wrong. I said it was not a carcinogen. Yeah. Um, DDT is, uh, was a subject of a kind of hysteria in the, in the early 1960s. Um, there are a few things to say about it. One is that because it is actually quite safe, you can eat it. And they, they, the reason why we know that is there was an experiment in which they fed it to prisoners for a couple of years, and they ate a certain amount of the powder every day, and they were okay. Um, there was also, at one time, a very unusual and much uh, undiscussed study which seemed to suggest that DDT exposure decreased your risk of cancer. Um, but the short version is it was heavily used. It was clearly overused. Um, it was, it's, uh, the extent to which it remained in the environment, the extent to which it became concentrated going up the food chain, the extent to which it was deleterious to birds, the extent to which it thinned eggshells, those were all things that people were terrified about. And, um, and the information that they had, if you go back and look at, for example, Rachel Carson and the evidence that she cites, that kind of evidence is completely unacceptable 40 years later. It's, it's you know, the guy who's doing the eggshell studies, it turned out he was also not giving the birds enough calcium, and that alone will, you know. The final outcome, as I understand it, is that um, some birds of prey are absolutely susceptible. Peregrine falcons, for example, are absolutely susceptible to DDT. Um, DDT arguably has certain other effects. It's never been demonstrated to be carcinogenic. And the reason why any of this is a point of discussion is that by eliminating DDT, malaria worldwide exploded. Malaria had been the great scourge of mankind in the 20th century. One by one, illnesses like yellow fever and stuff were, were either dampened down. Most of these diseases were in the United States, you know, in 1900. The United States had malaria in the South, for example, and it was gone. So uh, DDT took the total number of malaria cases in India, I think, down to 50,000 a year. I mean, some, it was a true miracle, not that it wasn't, you know, also uh, coming into situations where there were malaria-resistant mosquitoes and so on. But nevertheless, across the globe, it was a powerful, powerful way to save lives. When it was banned by Ruckel's house in 72 or 73 in this country, he specifically excluded medical uses uh, from the ban so that it could be used abroad. Environmental groups eager to make a, um, a name for themselves pushed hard, and in fact, the ban was, I think, really made final around the world in 2001, which is way too late. By then, people knew that, that um, the ban was, was lethal in terms of the number of people who died. And something like 30 million people have died as a result of, of banning this substance. And I think it's one of the great scandals. I mean, that's, that's more people than Hitler and Stalin together killed. And I'm sorry, but we don't have malaria in the United States. We don't have it in Sweden. We don't have it in France. So we don't care. We can ban DDT and use something else on our crops. That's the fact that people of color, the fact that people in Asia or in Africa, they're the ones that are dying. I'm sorry, a lot of people in this country just don't care. And I think that's really wrong. I'm getting riled up, you can see. I feel very strongly. We have an obligation as, you know, a rich society, a rich nation. We have an obligation to really be positively acting in the rest of the world. And this is not a good example for us. Knowing that kids see what you create, does that change how you write anything? Um, well, I, I, see, I operate on the assumption that kids are smarter than adults, um, because that's my experience, you know. I mean, it's not only that, 
that the world is now filled with adults who are turning to their kids, you know, how do I get online and do this? But um, I guess the answer is no. I sort of, you know, I'm very, I'm very trusting of my audience. You know, people always say, well, aren't you afraid that you're gonna do this? Or the first book that I did, which was a, called uh, The Andromeda Strain, people said, aren't you afraid that you're gonna be, you know, enhancing biological warfare and giving the government ideas? I thought if, you, if the government has to get ideas from novels, we're in terrible trouble, but, um, <laughs> but my answer is no. I mean, I think people read my books and understand, so. In your novel, State of Fear, you were very negative towards environmentalism. What caused you to be so prejudiced towards this religion? Mm, well, um, I don't think it should be a religion, you know, and uh, I don't know. It's interesting that you said it was prejudice, that um, it's a disagreement. I'm not sure it's a, I, I would argue it's not a prejudice, that it's a different way of seeing things. The, um, what I, the core of my argument is that if you're going to be responsive to the environment, the environment is always changing, and our understanding of the environment is always changing, and if we are to be, to do better with the environment that we do now, and I would tell you that at this moment, we have raw sewage seeping out of the Yellowstone National Park. So we're not doing a great job. I mean... I, I mentioned the parks because the parks are unlike uh, land use where there's conflicts about should we build a house or should we build... The, the parks are set aside. The parks are there for us to preserve them. And it turns out we don't know how to preserve them. And we won't admit that we don't know how to preserve them. We have... It's been a disaster what we've done. And so when I look at how we treat the environment, I think we have to be flexible. I think we have to try things and see how they turn out. We have to be ready to change course. We have to be able to adapt. We have to say we're wrong and let's do it right. We have to do research. This is all stuff that fundamentalist religions can't do. And if, and if, the envir if environmentalism is a kind of fundamentalist religion, then that's not a good way to manage the environment. We need a scientific approach. We need a non-religious approach. We need a way to look at this and do better than we've done. A lot better. It's essential. It's essential for you guys and, you know, for your children. Mr. Crichton? Hi. If, you, um, if more aspects of anthropological studies were incorporated in standard high school curricula, like we do here at Cleveland, um, do you think it have it would have an impact on social issues or awareness? And if you do, what kind of influence do you think it would have on such? Am I saved by the bell? Um, <laughs> what, what... I think what... What, um, what anthropology gives you is a, is a perspective that's outside your own culture. And I think we're all culture-bound in ways that, um, that we never think about. I mean, that's why we're bound. You know, how many meals should you have every day? How are they organized? You know, what do you call the first meal, the second meal, the third meal? How, what, what, is it, what is the proper way to sleep? You know, do you sleep on the floor? Or do you sleep off the floor? Um, you know, what, how do you interact with your family? Uh, what is your relationship to your mother, to your father? Do you have specific relationships with, um, with their brothers and sisters? You know, in, in some societies, you know, mother's brother's sister has, a, you know, or father's mother's brother has um, a uh, specific kind of relationship and is required to do particular things for a child, and a child will grow up knowing that if it's a question about sex, you know, obviously you don't want to talk to your mother or father, you go talk to this person. And um, that perspective, that people really do organize their, their lives and their societies differently, I think is very liberating. And we don't often have it. I'm glad that it's here. 
Uh, hi, Mr. Craig. Uh, my name is Vin, and this is a question from both me and my friend John Hines, who is a big fan of your work. In several of your books, it seems as if you are implying that big-time corporations, industries, and monopolies are a negative factor. Why is that, and what are your opinions on the matter? Um, you know, I love things that are really challenging, and um, some of you may know that the uh, the reason why Japanese automobiles became so um, phenomenally successful globally in the 1980s was because of the Japanese interest in an American named W. Edwards Deming, who was a quality control guy. And he was the one who, who helped them to understand, and he has a, you know, he's, a, he's dead now, but he's a revered person there, to understand that to get quality control, you have to do it all the way through manufacturing, and it's not, it's not something you just sort of slap on the bumper. And I finally met Deming, and uh, we were talking about this, and I said something negative about monopolies, and he said, what's wrong with monopolies? Monopolies are good. And I thought, ooh, you know, I'm an American, and I think monopolies are bad. Aren't, the, aren't monopolies bad? Shouldn't we have competition? He said, what's so good about competition? You know, we had this wonderful telephone company that um, was the best in the world, and now we don't. And, um, this is before cell phones. So I, I can be, I can have my mind changed. But I think in the novels, um, the uh, what I was trying to talk about is sometimes there are large monolithic organizations that tend to may be making decisions about what technology will be available to us so that when we see our range of choices, which in certain ways has exploded, for example, a lot of companies now make 30 kinds of toothpaste. You know, I mean, if you want Crest, there's 30 kinds of Crest, you know, there's little strips and there's tubes and there's stuff, bottles that stand up and bottles that lie down. And, you know, for what? I mean, it's a kind of fake choice. You're going to use, it's toothpaste. In other ways, I think the, the, um, the corporations actually are, may not be giving us the range of choices that we'd like. Hi, uh, I'm, my, my name is Brian Griffin. I'm a junior here at Cleveland. And I was wondering, as a writer yourself, how do you respond to the critiques of other journalists? Or do you even care or read about your books? Um, I tend not to read uh, reviews at all. Uh, a person who was very influential in my life is a, is a painter named Jasper Johns, um, who you may know for his paintings of American flags. And he's um, 12 years older than I am, so he's kind of, a, in a way, a mentor. And he said once in passing, he said, you know, I always read these reviews hoping to learn something that's interesting about my work, but I never do. And I thought, well, that's curious, because actually uh, I haven't either. And so since I, it seems as though in the end I always know more about my book, including its faults, than the reviewer, I'm only left with my emotional reaction. And I'm constituted in such a way that if the review is good, I don't really get a boost. But if it's bad, I feel terrible. So <laughs> from by and large, I don't read them. And that's been true for a long time, not just this last book. You stated earlier that when you used to draw blood, you felt sick. Did you feel sick at all when you were writing books as graphic as Congo? No, you know, it's, um, it's fantasy. It's, you know, I mean, I, I there was a time when, you know, when, when Jurassic Park was published, there was a large, it seems silly now, but there was a large kind of controversy about whether the book was anti-scientific, whether it was going to hurt science. I mean, it's, but my books are often seen as anti-something or other. And, um, and I used to go around and say to people, you know, guys, it's a dinosaur story. You know, I mean, as, <laughs> as Hitchcock used to say, it's just a movie. So, yeah, it's, um, I don't get upset. I'm, it's fun to write them. One day when... 
um, I used to get up very early and write. And one day my assistant came in and thought I, she thought I was having a seizure because I was sitting at my desk going. <laughs> and I, I was completely unaware. I was, I was imitating a raptor in order to write about <laughs> how the raptor did this biting, you know. So I guess maybe I'm, I act things out, but I don't know. I don't get upset about it. When I write. Do you think you could have done as well with books like the Andromeda Strain if you didn't have an MD degree or any knowledge of medical sciences and workings? No. Um, you know, the problem for a young writer is what do you write about? And before I went to medical school, I, I wrote, I think, what a lot of young writers write, sort of, you know, sh she wouldn't go out with me, and uh, we, you know, we we went to the party and had an argument, and she talked with this other guy instead, and it was, you know, it, it was what was on my mind at that time, but it wasn't really of wide interest, especially to older people who just looked at it and went, oh, another adolescent. So medical school was great because it gave me something to write about. It gave me something from the real world. And in that sense, it's, it's fantastic training. You know, you, you see people who are severely ill. You see life in a certain kind of raw and, and inherently dramatic way. And, um, and I came out of there four years later with a subject matter. And in that sense, it was fabulous. Hi, my name is Diana. Um, my question is, um, is there anything that you're working on right now or plan to in the near future? Um, I, I just finished a book that's pretty controversial in a lot of circles, you know, and so I'd like to do something that isn't that. And I, and I, it took me three years to do this last book, which is a lot of research, and I'd kind of like to do something that isn't that intensive. So, um, and I've also been married more times than I care to admit, <laughs> although, although not as many as Mickey Rooney. So, um, the, uh, so I thought I would actually write about a marriage and, um, and, um, and it would end in, of course, in a murder. And <laughs> the, um, the other thing is that, you know, people of all, all my life, people have said, you know, you write in a very external way. It's as if when I read your books, it's as if I'm watching a movie. You're not inside the characters' heads. And I would always say, because I don't think that's possible. I think it's, I think when somebody writes what the person is thinking, that's just a fantasy. It's, it's not, it's artificial. It's not really what's going on. And I think actually people don't have any idea why they do what they do. And so I thought I would write a book that would explain that point of view. So maybe that'll be controversial too. <laughs> Hi, my name is Dweezil, and what advice would you give for people who want to become writers? Right. It's a funny thing, you know. Uh, um, I, I never thought about it, but Stanley Kubrick was asked that question, you know, how do I become a movie director? He said, go make a movie, you know, get, get a camera, get a, go and do something. And I think it's the same. The reason to, to do that is... Is, I think there are two reasons. The first is that if you, if you are interested in writing, which I think of as a kind of physical occupation, I mean, I know you're just sitting there, but it feels like it's physical. You learn to do it in a way like you would learn to pull vault. You know, you gotta go do it. You gotta fall on your face a lot, and, you gotta, and then eventually you learn, okay, stick the pole in the slot this way, and you go up this way, and it's complicated. That's the first thing, so you learn a little bit about how to do it. The second thing, which is probably more important, is you learn if you really want to live your life that way. It's an unusual life. You know, you're alone a lot, and um, you're kind of a self-starter. You know, if, you know, when I get up in the morning, if I don't sit down and work, nothing happens. I don't have a boss. I don't have somebody saying, punch the clock. So it's not, a, it's not a lifestyle for everyone. Um, have you ever noticed people over-interpreting your work, and how does that make you feel? You know, um, not long after I wrote The Andromeda Strain, I got a, a letter from a 
16-year-old girl who said, well, I've read this book, and um, it's all based on the human hand. There were, there were six scientists, and then there were five, and those are the five fingers, and this one is this, and this one is this, and the person who didn't come was named Kirk, and Kirk is church. So the religious aspect is being set aside, and, um, and I read this, and this is all the symbolism that's in the book, and, uh, and I want to know if that's what you intended. And it was, it was a fantastic essay. And I read it, you know, just thought, wow, isn't this incredible? Because it made complete sense. And I had to, unfortunately, write her back and say, none of this was in my mind. <laughs> you know? I could see that it all worked out, and I didn't have, you know, uh, the character whose name was Kirk. I wasn't really thinking of church. I was actually thinking of Kierkegaard, but I didn't want to say Kierkegaard, so I shortened it. And, you know, I had different ideas doesn't mean that her interpretation was not right. I actually think, though, that my books are usually underinterpreted. I mean, people sort of go, oh, well, he's just doing that. A lot of people do that. Hi, my name is Jessica, and I'm a senior, and um, I'm in creative writing right now. So we started writing um, plays and books and poetry, but ha um, I had a really hard time trying to get started and getting in a state of like writing. So like, what advice would you give me or other students in my creative writing class? This is what I learned. I learned only really two, two or three things about how to write. The first thing is that it's a state, as you said, and the way to get yourself in the state is to follow a ritual. And if you look at how writers behave, most of them have rituals. Hemingway used to sharpen all his pencils every day, you know? And, uh, and a lot of writers, um, Jack London, Hemingway, and others would uh, insist that they did a certain number of words, 500 words or 1,500 words. And, you know, if Hemingway was going fishing the next day, he'd do double the number of words so that he could take the next day off. This kind of formal um, structure is really useful. My, for most of my life, I mean, I'm embarrassed to admit it, but I, my way of getting into it was I'd go in and I would make a cup of instant coffee and have a cigarette. And by the time I'd done that, I was ready to go. Now, of course, all that's left is the instant coffee, but... Um, <laughs> Any, anything that you do repeatedly will get you there. The other thing that I discovered, which is really weird, I, I used to have writer's block a lot in my life, and I discovered actually that the, the real reason why I was blocked is I didn't know what I wanted to say. And actually, if you sit down before you know what you want to say, that's worse, because now you're staring at the paper or the computer going, I don't know what to say. So... I learned that it was easier to decide what you wanted to say before you actually did it. So I don't sit down until I've really thought through things. And I'll think about something to write for a couple of years. You don't have that luxury in this class. But, you know, it's nice to really kind of make a plan and then sit down and execute it. That helps. Hi, my name is Arati, and I was just wondering, you said that um, when you write books, it causes a lot of controversy. So after you publish, do you have any doubts that it may cause more? Usually, uh, what's in a way, what's unfortunate about the controversy is that generally you can predict it in advance exactly how it'll go and exactly who will say what, who will like it, who won't like it. I mean, it's as if everybody's decided their position on everything and you're just kind of feeding the hopper in some way. And uh, I did, I mentioned earlier Jasper Johnson, I, I did a book about him in the 1970s. It was a, he was having a large retrospective at a museum in New York. And after I'd worked on this book for nine months and gotten all the pictures and it was such an intense thing, I said to him, well, I wonder what the reaction will be when the book comes out, and when the show comes out. And there was, he and a couple of other people who worked with him were there, and they just sort of stared at me. Like, what do you mean? This one will say this, this one will say this, this one will say this, this one will like it, this one will think it's stupid, this one will think it's overrated. The entire art world, had, you know, they knew everyone's response before the show came out. So no one was having a fresh response. 
And I think in controversial areas, like the, the last book, which is in the environmental area, people have their positions and they hold them. And since the idea of the book is to try and encourage people to take a fresh perspective, a lot of people won't like that. Hi, my name is uh, Jonathan, and I wanted to know, as a writer, what type of books do you read for inspiration or just for leisure? You know, it's funny. Um, I don't, I practically don't read any uh, fiction. And I don't know why that is. I think it's because maybe I don't have time to do that. Um, I'm usually researching something, and I'm often... Uh, you know, trying to answer a question that I'm uh, that may be very ill-formed. Uh, right now, for example, and I don't know why, I'm interested in uh, the extent to which people, two things. The, what is it that makes people really want to tell other people how to behave? You know, like, let me tell you, I mean, aside from, you guys are in school, so that's a different, but, but I mean, in the, in the wider world, there are people who really feel that they know how everybody ought to be. Whereas my feeling is always I, I have my hands full just taking care of myself and other people, as long as they stop at the stoplights and so on, they can make their own decisions. So I'm interested in what psychologically makes somebody have that confidence. And the other part of that is there's a, I think there's a deep and secret human impulse to live in a totalitarian state. I mean, we all say, oh, no, we wouldn't want that. But, I mean, you know, it's amazing the extent to which... There's a sort of conformist desire among people. So I don't understand that, and I'm not even sure what I said is true, but I'm reading a lot to try and get a perspective. Hi, my name is Lindsay Ngo. Um, if you had not began your career in writing, uh, what career would you have chosen? I guess I would still be a doctor and still telling people, you know, why are you calling me in the middle of the night? <laughs> Uh, the other, I was interested in being an architect. You know, I like that. Um, I like the idea of something that combined engineering and some kind of artistic aspect. But, um, but the truth is, I don't think I can imagine myself doing anything else. And I feel phenomenally fortunate to do what I do. I mean, I, I get to ask some question. You know, what was, what was going on in the United States um, in the late 1930s when Hitler was establishing this, you know, this Nazi society in Germany? How were the Americans reacting? I mean, I know some Americans admired Hitler, some famous ones, Charles Lindbergh, Joseph Kennedy, who was John Kennedy's father. A lot of people were, but what was, how, how did Americans feel um, what was anti-Semitism like at that time? Uh, that's before I was born, you know, so, um, although not long before I was born. So I feel, I feel really privileged that I can take a few months out of my life and research that. This will be the last question. Um, what led you to believe that the facts proving the hazards of secondhand smoke are misleading and false? Okay, before I answer, I should tell you that after we're done, if you guys want to keep uh, talking, I'll keep sitting here and we can talk some more. Secondhand smoke uh, is an amazing story. And uh, the, the, sh the historical, the short version is that the EPA investigated it in, I think, 1991 or two, and, uh, and was not able to demonstrate the, that there was a carcinogenic effect. By not able to demonstrate, it means that you have to, according to the EPA guidelines, you have to have no, what are called 95% confidence intervals. In, in other words, it has to be statistically strong evidence. They couldn't get it. They did six studies. They combined all the studies. They still couldn't get it. They dropped their thing to 90%. To, to go from 95% to 90% is hard unless you know statistics. 90% means it may or may not be there, okay? You want 95% or 99%. They didn't have it. They nevertheless classified it as a, as a Class A carcinogen. California uh, was the first state to pass anti, you know, uh, secondhand smoke ordinances, all of which I'm in favor of. 
you know? I don't like people smoking next to me. I don't feel good in places like Germany and France where they, where they smoke right next to you. I'm not, I don't want people to smoke. Smoking is bad, smoking causes cancer. But secondhand smoke does not cause cancer. And part of how I got to it was my daughter and her friends were going down the street, you know, pulling, pulling their shirts up as they passed some poor schlump out, you know, smoking a cigarette. And I said, what are you doing? And they said, oh, you know, it's cancer. It's not, you know. And, and what happened was in 98, a federal judge said to the EPA, you can't do this. You haven't made the case. You have broken your own guidelines. This is not demonstrated. It has never been demonstrated. I mean, believe me, there are physicians and groups dying to show it. And it has never been brought to a level of significance. It may have other effects. It's certainly unpleasant. But I'm, I'm opposed to passing laws based on phony science. I think it's a bad precedent.